Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. All right, let's stand to our feet right now. We're so thankful to be found in the house of God, aren't you, today? Amen. I'm glad two or three are glad. Are you glad to be found in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We're so thankful to be found in the house of God today. I'm so thankful that each and every one of you have made a journey to get here uh, this, this morning. There's an interesting uh, story in the Bible where Israel was under Babylonian captivity for 70 years, 70 years. And so there was this uh, man named Ezra and uh, this, uh, this other man named Nehemiah. They had, this, they had this burden to go back to Jerusalem and, and uh, they were able to persuade the king uh, to let Israel go back to Jerusalem to build a house to build the house of the Lord. And so they had to overcome so many different struggles, so many different challenges in just getting this house built to build back the walls of this great city that once was amazing, where the glory of God had fallen. And so they had this burden to go back to the place where they where God met them. And so they come to this journey and they finally build the house of the Lord. And, and the Bible says that when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their, uh, in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good. Because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great joy when they praised the Lord. Because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a greater foundation than just a, a temple and a church. We have a foundation that we can build our lives upon. And that is Jesus Christ. He was the foundation for us today and so today I don't know about you but I feel like we need to enter into a place of praise and thanksgiving in this house I don't know what you've come to do today but I've come to praise the Lord I've come to lift up the Lord today David said David said I will rejoice and be glad because this is the day that the Lord has made this is the day that the Lord has made. We have an opportunity today to let God intervene, to let God move in this house. So I wonder today if you could just begin to lift up your voices, lift up your hands, and invite the presence of God in this house. And we can pray together as a church body, begin lifting our voices, giving praise, giving thanks today. Because we have a foundation that we can build our lives upon. God, we love you. And we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, God, for what you're doing, God. We ask you, Lord, to come in, into this house. Lord, I pray that you would make this a dwelling place of your presence, of your glory, God. We ask, Lord, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done in this place, in this house, as it is in heaven today. God, I pray that you would begin to move on the hearts and minds of your people, that you would begin, God, to do a work in us, Lord. I will rejoice, God. I will rejoice, God. I may have had a hard week. I may have had a hard day the other day. But, Lord, today I'm going to rejoice. Come on, can we just lift up our voices? Come on, can we just go into a time of prayer today? Come on, let's enter into, the, into his presence right now. Come on, he inhabits the praises of his people. He inhabits the praises of his people today. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We thank you, God. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Come on, can we continue with that spirit of praise and worship right now?
Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift up the name of Jesus in this house. Let's lift up the name of Jesus in this house. Hallelujah, Jesus. We magnify you, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Do you believe there's power in the name of Jesus? Do you believe there's healing in the name of Jesus? Do you believe there's victory in the name of Jesus? Do you believe there's redemption in his blood? Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we worship you, God. Thank you for the revelation of your name. Thank you for your name, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. Isaiah prophesied a child would be born and a son would be given. And the government would be upon his shoulders and his name would be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That was the prophecy of that child that would be born in Matthew 121, where Mary had a child and his name was Jesus. The power of the name of Jesus is that when you call on the name of Jesus, you call on Wonderful. When you call on the name of Jesus, you call on the Prince of Peace. When you call on the name, man, I feel the Holy Ghost. When you call on that name, everything that Jehovah revealed himself in the Old Testament with is now revealed fully in the New Testament. And we have that revelation that the God that moved on for David and the God that moved for Moses and Aaron and Abraham is the God that moves today. It's the name of Jesus. That's why there's authority in the name of Jesus. That's why when we baptize you in Jesus' name, all your sins are washed away. If you're thankful for that name, Jesus, why don't you just take another 60 seconds and praise God for a little bit. Thank you for your name, Lord. Thank you for your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There's no other God like you. There's no other God beside you. You are God and God alone. You are the God that died on the cross for our sins. You are the God that came and rescued me. You're the God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Do you feel that authority in this house? Come on, do you, do you feel that authority where your faith right now doesn't feel so depleted? But now that Jesus is in here, in the midst of just two or three of us, there's, there's, a good, there's way more than two or three of us. But in here right now, God can do a miracle. I, I know you've struggled this week. I know you've had a hard week at th this week. But I believe that Jesus wants to move if you will just let him. If you will just let God. If you will just surrender to him. God will move on you today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your worship today. You may return back to your seats today. Amen. Why don't you tell, tell someone you look good today? All right. No, I don't think anyone heard that. Why don't you tell your neighbor you look really good today? <laughs> amen. Amen, amen. Amen. Just a couple of announcements today. Uh, this Wednesday we have midweek Bible study. Man, if you were not here this past Wednesday, if you were not here this past Wednesday, I feel sorry for you because pastor has been preaching. He has been preaching and the Lord's been depositing many great messages. And uh, amen. It was a blessing. So I hope that you can make it out this Wednesday. Service starts at 730. 
Um, and then uh, this Friday, we have youth service. Our young people, are you, you excited for this Friday? All right. All right. I got a couple of you. All right. This Friday, we have youth service, uh, 7.30 as well. Um, also, uh, if you are a first-time guest, thank you so much for making Grace Apostolic Church your place of worship today. Can we give them a great hand clap today, church? Thank you so much for joining us today. If you, are, if you are a guest today, we want to thank you again. It's our honor that you are here with us. And uh, to show that we appreciate you coming out uh, this morning, we have a gift for you. Right before you leave, there's a, there's a greeter's desk right outside. Uh, you can go and get your gift. And, we, of course, we would love to connect with you more about with what Grace Apostolic Church uh, has to offer and what you, where your place is here. Where your place here is at Grace, we would love for you to join our family. Amen. Uh, at this time, uh, as we have not been doing for the last bit, uh, for the last few months, we have not been marching for our offering. Uh, however, there are two baskets outside in the main lobby. If you would like to drop off your tithes and your offerings, you can go ahead and drop it off in the, in the baskets. Or if you would like to, you can go online at GACCawson.org and you can give online. You can pay your tithes and your offerings uh, online as well. But on top of that today, uh, we do have a, uh, we are going to be taking up a special offering today. Um, as Pastor, Pastor Stephen, he is on, uh, he is the assistant director in the, uh, in the secretary for Missions America. And today is National Adopt-A-City Day where we have the opportunity to give to help churches in regards of uh, uh, helping them build uh, any, any special projects uh, the church would need or anything uh, or any of their needs. Uh, and also it, we can help churches uh, reach their communities. You know, we're, we're trying to plant churches all across America. And so they're not always, you know, financially capable to just outsource and reach their communities. But today we have a chance to help those churches uh, with those needs. And also it helps them uh, attend general ministry conferences as well. Uh, you know, it helps them pay for their finances. And we want to be a blessing to our home missionaries. We want to be a blessing to them just as much as we are to, to world missionaries. And so uh, we are so thankful for those that have had the courage and, and, the, um, and the calling to, to start a church. It's not easy starting from the ground up. It, it really isn't. So we have the opportunity to give uh, to them. And you can also give uh, to this cause in the, in the main lobby as well. Uh, but at this time, we're going to play a video uh, in regards to National Adopt a City Day. Hi there, I'm Matt Perdue, the Missions America Director for the Assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, I pray that you and your family and your local church are doing fantastic. We do come to you today with some exciting news. Sunday, September 13th, 2020 we will be having our National Adopt-A-City Day. This is the second year that we've done this, and we look forward to a fantastic response. What we're asking, number one, is for every pastor on Sunday, September 20th, in your service, to take up a one-time offering. And this one-time offering will go directly to being split among our 17 home missionaries on our Adopt-A-City program. It'll go to bless them and help them. Many of them are in building programs and they're expanding their facilities during this time. Great things are happening in our home missions department. So that one-time offering will be a huge blessing. Number two, once you take that offering up, you can either send it to the headquarters in Memphis and they will get that to us, or you can go to missionsamerica.aljc.org and you can give online. We would be more than happy to receive it either way. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to email me at pastormattperdue at gmail.com. Connect to all of our social media outlets for more information. May the Lord continue to richly bless you and your family and your local church. God bless you. Amen. And the video is in September 20th, but it's actually today. So uh, we know the costs that go into uh, block parties and things reaching your, your city. So we've got 17 home missions pastors that are starting 
works from scratch, and uh, so you know how hard it is when you have a few people and the, the amount of money it takes. So we're asking that each church that's established in the organization can help give towards helping them with block parties and outreach methods. And when you have when you have a church like us, we can gather together and really work. But when you have a smaller church, it's harder. So today, if you can, uh, there's the basket that's designated to Missions America. Please help us. Now we know we're a great giving church when it comes to foreign missions, and we we are so thankful for that. But just as important as foreign is home missions here in America. If any, if there's ever been a time that America needs more churches, it's today, folks. Amen. On every street corner, we need to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so your offering will go to help that as, as being the secretary, um, assistant director for that. I, I hope that our church could, could show up for that, that offering today. I also want to say how thankful I am for my mother. It's her birthday today, and I want to wish her a happy birthday. Wonderful woman of God. <clears throat> Amen. I wouldn't be here without her, so I just want to let you know that I'm thankful that she, she gave birth to me. 43 plus years ago. I love her and my father very much. And I love each, each and every one of you. And this morning I was thinking about how, how privileged and how thankful I am that I can pastor Grace Epstock Church. You know, you hear about people talking about how hard pastoring is, but you know, when, you, when, you, when you lead good people, it makes it, makes it easier. And I appreciate uh, you being a great church and a wonderful church. And I appreciate you very much. Standing with me, the book of Psalm, chapter 89. I, I like what Brother Brother Matt said. He, he talked about that the God that is of Abraham, Moses, in the Old Testament is the revealed to us in Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for the revelation of the name of Jesus. Amen. That's why people, when they've been born in, or baptized, and behind us here is a screen. There, behind the screen is a, a water for baptism. We believe absolutely that in the name of Jesus, when you go down to that water, your sins are washed away. doesn't matter how bad they sin. That's why it's so hard for Jesus, because when he drank of that cup, he had a drink of the worst sinner you can imagine. Locked up in some penitentiary somewhere for ungodly sins. Jesus had to become that to save every person. So in the name of Jesus, we baptize you. That's why when some people are baptized in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they get rebaptized in Jesus' name. Because Father, Son, Holy Ghost is titles. Father, Son, Holy Ghost does not necessarily lead you to God. It's kind of generic. But the name of Jesus always leads you to God. Because when you get Jesus, you get the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Father, Son, Holy Ghost doesn't necessarily lead you to Jesus, but Jesus always leads you to Father, Son, Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen. Well, I wasn't in my notes. Amen. Psalm 89, verse number 1. Appreciate all the hard work from the men that were up here tirelessly being led by Brother Truba, getting us a new sound system. We've had a new sound system sitting in the back. Brother Truba had organized and programmed it. Now it's out for us today. It's an improved uh, our sound, it seems like the sound, you always need something else, you know, always gets, is the way it is, but uh, these, these, just to let you know, when, if we ever ask for a money raise, these, these speakers here are how many, how many years old? 27 years old. So those, they've been around a while. So at some point in time, folks, it may have to be a, a need for us to get some, some new speakers. Um, it's kind of like having a Lamborghini, but having a little tiny engine in it, you know, you, you have all this. We have an awesome soundboard, but uh, but it also helps us improve our online presence. I know many people aren't here today, and some are still at home watching, so um, that's kind of why what we've been doing. But thank you, men, that, that ran snakes and lines and all those things to make it good for us, that when we come to church, we can just sit here and enjoy it. Isn't that, isn't that an awesome thing? <laughs> you can just come and enjoy it. All right, verse number one, I've met long enough. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I'm going to speak up and say something. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. And this is what he says in verse 4. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all 
generations. Selah. The psalmist said, I will sing a song unto God, and it will be a song of his mercies. Of all the things that God is today, he is absolutely a merciful God. Aren't you glad for his promise today? That no matter how bad things got, even after you received the Holy Ghost, even after you were baptized, I remember being baptized, I didn't want to touch anything. Because I knew I'm the cleanest as I'll ever be right here and right now. I said eight years old, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know. But life happens and you get involved and you get in the trenches and you get dirty and your robes get tattered and you think, man, God, there's no way. There's no way you can forgive me for this one, but God's mercy, if you're going to sing a song, man, sing a song about his mercy. We didn't get here because of our own righteousness, our righteousness is filthy rags, but the only reason, the only song I can sing is the reason I'm here today is because I serve a God of great mercy. I want you to raise your hand. Just thank God. Lord, if it wasn't for your mercy, come on, don't forget about how merciful he is. Don't forget about his greatness. Does. Oh, God, how about she tie? Oh, God, if it wasn't for your mercy, continuously, Lord, picking me up, God, I would be lost. God, I never want that to grow old. I never want that song to become old in my life. But, oh, God, I'm thankful, God, for the song of mercy that you put into our heart today. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, I want to, we can give him a hand clap of praise one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, he's so good to us today. Amen. Everyone say amen to the reading of the word. You may be seated. <clears throat> in the name of the Lord. This de- past December, last winter, I, I, uh, me and my daughter began writing a, a, a play for the church, and um, out of, out of, right out of nowhere, I came up with two songs uh, for the play, and I, I'm not a, you know, I'm, it's not really my thing, but I just happened to get these words came out, and, and I didn't have a melody, and so I didn't have a melody for the songs, or for the, for the words, and I want to kind of marry together, you know, without a melody of a song, you don't really have much of a song, you have a poem. Um, so I, I was thinking about how does a melody come together with lyrics? How do you join the two together? Like you said, do you get the melody first or do you get the lyrics first? How does it work? And so I, I decided I'm not, I can't figure this out by myself, so I'm going to call someone that might know a little thing about this. So I got a hold of Sister Gina Vera, whose husband pastors in Ohio, and I, we know her in the apostolic ranks, a woman that has wrote, written many songs, many songs that have been published, many songs, that, that's her thing. If you want to talk about writing songs, Sister Gina Vera is someone that you're going to go to. And I, I told her, I said, Sister Vera, I said, uh, you know, um, as of right now, I've got some lyrics, but this isn't really my thing. And so I said, how does, a, how does it work with you? What's your experience like when writing a song and getting the melody? Does the melody come first, or do you have a tune in your heart? And, you know, I said, it's not my thing, but I just, this is I'm something I'm going to try, so I'm talking to you about this. And she said this to me. She goes, I, it might not be your thing. She goes, but I believe, Brother Traxel, that everyone has at least one song in them. I said, well, Sister Vera, I may have to preach on that sometime. (laughs) Evidently, somewhere in the recesses of our spirit and in our mind and our heart, Sister Vera would tell us there is a song waiting to be sung. You don't have to. It's it's a God thing. God loves music. Everything we love and hate, it's because God put that into us to love and hate those things. We're made in his image and his likeness. So we are musical people. We love music because God is the essence. He is, he's the one, the author of the music for us. And so somewhere we have a song that's going to be sung. And we know the power of music. We know the power of songs. Songs have a way of encapsulating the feeling of a whole time period. You know when you hear some songs, that's 60s. That's, how can you know that? Uh, By the melody, that song was from the 70s. How do you know that? Because music can encapsulate the trend and the theme and the the, the feeling of a whole generation. You can hear the songs against war from the 60s. Freedom to be hippies. and uh, You can hear the the anger and you can hear the songs that are are sung that encapsulate that, that time period. Putting lyrics and music together 
is telling a story from a moment in history. And when you hear that song, you can remember where you were. You can remember how you felt. You remember the culture of the time when you hear the sign, signs, everyone's a sign. No, I don't know what song it is. 60 signs, 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 everywhere's a sign or whatever. You remember what was happening in the news reports. You know what was happening in history. You knew what the newspapers, you knew the, uh, the, the riots, all these things. Because simply by hearing the song, if an event is big enough or important enough, It is not enough just to put that event into our history books. But to really pay homage to an event, if you put it into a song, that song is immortalized. You can read it in your books all you want, but when someone sings a song about event, I will never forget hearing the song by Lightfoot about the Edmund Fitzgerald. Talk about putting chills up your backbone when you hear the song. I believe these men faced three days of a storm on Lake Superior. Edmund Fitzgerald, how, <clears throat> how it went down. Just, just rattled, but, but memorializes that experience because it was put into a song. And today, we can recall our history as we sing a song about our flag that still waves as the man in the early morning, oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave. History in a song, events can be memorialized in a song. The power of music, the power of what you sing is so important to the attitude of your life. And so, if it is to be only one song that I have, if it is only one shot for me to get this right, And if it is a song about my God, what song would I encapsulate? What song would I sing that would speak the essence of what God is to me? It is found in Psalm 89 and 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. And the question I ask today, is there really anything else that the redeemed of the Lord can sing? Is there really another song that so encapsulates our God as a song of mercy? He is a miracle worker. Everyone say amen, he is. He is all powerful, we know that he is. We know that he is a God that gives gifts unto his children and that's all fine and well. But that is not why I love him. I don't love him because he's a gift giver or a miracle maker. I love him because when I had no hope, I love him because when I was down and out and everybody wrote me off as making too many bad choices, when I didn't have any place else to go, I met Jesus Christ. He came into my life and with mercy and with grace, he picked me up and gave me a fresh start on my way. And so with my mouth, I will let all generations from here to the next generation know that without God's mercy, I would be lost. And so that's why if I'm going to sing a song about God, it's only going to be about the mercy of Jesus Christ in my life. Because my God is merciful. Listen, they talk about him. They, they, they bring his name down. They say speak his name in vain. They speak his name when they're mad and angry and they're not giving him praise. But of all the things he is, I want with my mouth to declare you right now, my God is merciful. If it wasn't for his cross, if it wasn't for his mercy, if it wasn't for my grace, this place would be empty. But praise God for his mercy. Because my God's merciful. When God gives you a promise, as they say, you can take it to the bank. It's good. And one promise I know of that's in the word of God is God's mercies are new every morning. That's biblical. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23, it says, It is of the Lord's mercies. Is this so true? It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not 
consumed. Because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You should put that on your refrigerator. Remember that every day. What a beautiful promise that is of God's mercy that Jeremiah writes. Every morning, guess what? Because of that, every morning I can start my day with high hopes. Every day I, I, I am advantaged towards success. Because God has already set his mercy on me on that day in that morning. Guess what that means? That means mercy is there before I needed it. His mercies are new every morning. Before you get up, the mercies were already there given for that day. If you wonder if God is with you, if you wonder if God can forgive you and help you, let me tell you this, he was already at the place you needed him most with fresh mercy before you got there. You know, I used to look at that scripture as a scripture saying that God's mercy is new for the things you did yesterday, right? Think about it. So I messed up yesterday, but his mercies are new today. Okay, I messed up, so his mercies, praise God for the new day, right? Our mercies are, but, but let's say you made a mistake and you go to bed at 10 o'clock at night. Are you telling me that God's mercy doesn't start till you wake up the next day? That means there's a gap where God doesn't have mercy on you. No, God's mercy is always on you. God's mercy is not there for the things you did yesterday. God's mercy is there for the things that you have not even done yet. And bad choices that you made and things you made, but his mercy has covered you all day long. There's never a span in the 24-hour day that God says, my mercy will not rest on you. And I will be there for you even when you fall flat on your face and your friends have walked away. And everybody writes you off and says, hey, he's never going to make it. But there's a God there with a cushion of mercy that because of his mercy, I've not been destroyed. Why? Before I had that event or that accident, God was already there with his mercy because every day his mercy is new God's mercy doesn't wait till the next day <laughs> well hope something doesn't happen by midnight because my mercy stopped at 10 o'clock at night and you're going to have to wait till the next morning before I have some refresh of mercy no, his mercy is new for the time you've not been there yet his mercy is fresh today when you make a bad choice that his mercy is already there for you waiting for you to get there Look at Psalm 37, 23. The steps of a good man. Everyone say good man. We're not talking about a sinful man. We're talking about a man doing good. His neighbors call him good. He's a good man. Man, th this guy's doing great. The good man stepped to order of the Lord, and he delighted in his way. Uh-oh. Though he fall. No, 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 no. He can't be a good man if he falls. Mm, that doesn't happen. Good men don't fall. You know, he's, he, but the Bible already says this is a good man. And though he fall, that means God understood even good men and good women. Because we're flesh, because we have tendencies in us to do the wrong thing. That we're going to fall, though he fall. But however, because God's mercies are new every day, the Bible says he shall not utterly be cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. What does that mean? That means like a little baby. What do, you, what do you parents do? you got your hands on their hands. you got the, you're, you're waiting, they're stumbling. You're like, you've got hands, right? The Bible says a good man, though he fall, God won't let utterly destroy him because he upholdeth him with his hands. That means with his mercy, he takes care of him, though he stumbles and falls. But because God's mercy was great enough, God caught me by his hand. Do I have to have repercussions? Sure, maybe. Do I have some bumps and bruises along the way? Yes, maybe. But guess what? I've not died and I'm still here. And guess what? I'm still singing my song. So when the devil comes to you and tells you you've done too much bad stuff, you've gone too far, the world has rejected you, your friends have rejected you, one thing, someone that's never rejected you is a God who's merciful. So I want this whole generation to know, instead of living in a miserable ruin, I have come to the house of God, and with all my heart and my praise, I am worshiping and lifting up the name of Jesus, who is a God of mercy. I 
will not die. I will not be destroyed. I will sing of the mercies of Jesus Christ. Because God is merciful. Because his mercies are new every morning. They fail not. Great is his faithfulness. It's interesting about this beautiful passage of where it is situated in God's word. It's important to see these things because every place you see in the word of God, everything is there on purpose, right? The, this beautiful passage, this beautiful promise is found in the book of Lamentations. Oh, that's a p- pretty word, Lamentations. Isn't it beautiful? It just rolls off your tongue, Lamentations. It means the lamenting of Jeremiah. It's not a happy book, folks. It's, Dad, can you read me a bedtime story? So I want to have sweet dreams. You don't bust open the book of Lamentations and talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. The book of Lamentations is a collection of five poems mourning the destruction of Jerusalem. These poems express the heart-wrenching grief and the sorrow and remorse for the sin that caused the downfall of Judah. As a reminder, the audience of the book of Jeremiah would be those remnants of Jerusalem that have survived the destruction of Jerusalem, have thrived and have made it, not thrived, but made it and didn't die. The reason that these lamentations were written were to preserve the memory for, for future generations that will let them know the extent of the devastation of their people at a time. Who wants to revisit that? I really want to have a good story about our history. Let's go back to mm, Lamentations. No one's going to want to remember that. It's only simply a reminder of how bad it was when you turned from God and I'm lamenting your sin. I'm lamenting your failures and this devastation. Mm, Give me something that's good to my soul, right? Give me something that's going to pick me up and lift me up and help me feel good about myself. Do not read the book. That's what you're looking for. In fact, if you look at what it says in Jeremiah in Book of Lamentations, chapter 1, 16. Now, the thing is, Jeremiah told them, right? Turn to God. Turn with your heart. Judah, don't don't sin. Don't don't do Jews. Come on. But they didn't listen. So now they're listening. They're not listening. Jeremiah's writing lamentation about where they are. And of course, Jeremiah gets picked up. And they said, Jeremiah, you're going with us. Jeremiah, I don't want to go. Yes, you're coming with us. You don't have a choice. Even though they couldn't stand Jeremiah, what he said, they always wanted him around. I don't know what the what this case is here. But in, Jer- in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 16, he says this in his words. He says, for these things I weep. Mine eye, mine eye runneth down with water. Because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. How many of us have been there? How many of us have felt overrun? How many of us felt forsaken? How many of us have been in a place where we thought, man, I'm not going to make it one more day. The the enemy has prevailed. I've made mistakes. I sinned. I didn't turn to God when I should have. And here we are. My, my eyes are weeping and I have no comforter and I, my children are lost. I'm desolate. I have no hope at all. This is where Judah is at the moment. Yet, we know that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable to us. God is the one that spoke the words that we have today. It's his writing, it's his book. And because he brought the word to us, he made no mistakes concerning where his promise would be placed in his words. Now, if you ask me, that verse in Lamentations 3 would be beautiful in Psalms. 
It would fit beautiful in the song of Solomon's about his love and about his fragrance and all these good things. But here we find a placement of, of Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, the promise of his mercy. It's, it's very important that we catch this because it makes a huge difference where we are. It's almost right, if you look at it, it's almost smack dab in the middle of Jeremiah lam lamenting his woes. Almost smack dab in the middle of his book comes a promise from God. In the middle of him feeling lost. In the middle of Jerusalem's defeat. He's speaking all these lamentations. But then all of a sudden a new river of inspiration crosses over his pen. And in his mind a river of inspiration flows out of him. That doesn't seem to belong to fit the narrative but it does. Here we are, destruction, chaos, being afraid, being desolate, that's the narrative. However, in comes a new narrative, a new flow of God's inspiration. It's a song that began at the Garden of Eden and will flow through eternity. It's a song of God's mercy. In other words, what he's saying, it doesn't matter how bad things look right now. It doesn't matter how desolate things look right now. Right in the middle of your moment, right in the middle of your chaos, there is a river of inspiration that reminds you no matter how bad it looks God has new mercy and God has new grace you just gotta get back up God wants someone to know you can make it today Right in the middle of your lamentations, right in the middle of you lamenting how bad your family is, how bad your kids are, how bad life is. God says, no, 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 I've got another promise for you. It's a promise that you're going to make it. Why? Because the song of mercy still sings in the people that believe his word today. Psalm 89 is a song about mercy. Specifically to the house of King David. This is mercy according to his, his promise he made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 11 through 17. When he says that his house and his kingdom and his throne will be established forever. Now, God tells him through Nathan, David, I took it from Saul. Saul had done a bunch of bad things, but I'm promising you here, Saul lost it, but David, I will never take it from you. I will never take the throne from your, from your family's lineage. It will always be there. Now this is a promise that God gave to him. Now remember, this, the, the song of 89 of Psalm began with God's mercies. And it's to the promises of David. It's his mercy that he kept his promise. Even through all the things that happened, this God kept his promises of mercy to this household. Because see, the problem with David is, from his lineage... His throne was left in the hands of a lot of broken people. The throne was, was filled with people that were not perfect. Sons and grandsons of this great King David. Even David wasn't perfect. We know that. Solomon wasn't perfect. Rehoboam. And all down the line, all these men were imperfect people. Yet they're, 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 they're living in a promise that God had made. These people had become so bad, so angry, so evil. Some of these kings, great-grandsons of David, even put their children in the fire to their gods, Molech, and began to burn their children. And God chastened them. In fact, historians say that Psalm 89 was written over the despair of, of King Jehoiakim and Israel taken captive by Babylon. Now imagine, God gave me a promise, but here our king has been taken to Babylon. There's no one on the throne, God are you sure your promise is still good for us today? Are you sure your promise can still hold up underneath all the faltering, all the failing of all the people that have come through the lineage of David? David's lineage was filled with broken people. It seemed like there was no way that God could keep his promise to such an evil people and such to his servant David. But the writer says, but forever I will sing of thy mercy. Why? Because the writer in his inspiration knew, regardless of how bad the people got, God's promise will last forever. How does he know that? Because in verse 35 of 89, I will not lie to David. 
when I gave you a promise that you will succeed, when I gave you a promise that your lineage will sit on the throne forever, I will not lie to David. And through the generations of David, John is baptizing people by the Jordan River. And out steps a 30-year-old rabbi coming on the scene, Jesus Christ, the son of David. In Revelation 22, 16, God said, I am the root and the offspring of David. This God-man, Jesus in the flesh, is the result of the promise that he gave to David. There would be a lot of broken people along the line, but there would be a perfect man that would be the responsibility to carry the sins of the weight of the world on his shoulders. That would be a king, not in the earth, but that would be a king of kings, and his throne would be established forever. Isaiah said of this king in the line of David, of his government and his peace, there shall be no end. Jesus Christ stood at the end of God's promise unto David. In Luke 18, 38, the Bible says there was a certain blind man, blind from his birth. And he cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. That's that him crying out, Jesus, son of David, is absolutely saying, I know who you are, Jesus. You are the Messiah. You are the one I've been looking for. And because this man possibly, maybe someone read him the Psalms of David. Maybe this man as a child couldn't read himself. But maybe his mother and, his mother and father came along a passage in Psalm 89 when he was a baby. That one day God's promise is forever. And he's a God of mercy. And this man connected the dots. If this is the son of David, if this is the merciful one, guess what? All I got to do is get up and find him. Why? Because I know he's a God of mercy. If you are who you say you are, guess what? I can leave this place seeing why. Because you're a man of mercy. Because I know who you are. You are part of the promise of God. You can only give mercy. Because that is what you are. This merciful father this merciful God speaks to his disciples. He's getting ready to go away in John chapter 14, or John chapter 14, verse number 16. He says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Verse number 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Why? How can he say that? Because he's the end result of the promise that God made to David. He said, I'm going to send the comforter. No, I'm not going to send it. I will be the comforter. And when I began to read that, I, I thought, oh man, if someone could go back in time and wake up Jeremiah. I wonder if someone could go take that man, let him know, Jeremiah, your cries were not in vain. There is a comforter. His name is Jesus Christ. All hope is not lost. All hope is not over. There is a Savior full of mercy. He is our comforter today. Let's all stand to our feet. Jeremiah said, where is my comforter? Jeremiah, I found him. His name is Jesus. Who is the one that will dry our tears? Who is the one that will mend our broken heart? Who is the one that will give us hope when all hope is gone? I found him. And his name is Jesus. He's the fulfillment of the promise that God gave to David. That on your throne will, will dwell a man forever. It might not be an earthly throne like you think, but there's a throne in heaven. His name is Jesus Christ, the root and offspring of David. I'm telling you, I don't care how bad your family looks. I don't care where your children are. I don't care what mess you got going on in your life. There is a God that's full of mercy. And when you want to lament how bad life is, let there be an inspiration. Let the song of mercy flow out of your heart. Oh, I would be lost. I would be gone. But Jesus Christ found me. We sing many songs at the graveside of people. Songs that cheer our hearts. Songs that don't really do the job, really. It's done bring the departed back to us, but it's just a song we sing. 
How many of us could have been there? How many of us could have been put to rest because of something? How many of you fell asleep at the wheel driving down the road and you shook and God woke you up? And I'll never forget my cousin Matthew Bowen tell a story that he literally drove home sleeping. He didn't even know how he got home. He was so tired. He told a story one time, I believe it was him, he told a story about his gas was on empty, he had no money for gas, and the Lord just took his dial. And how many things has God done for us that if we look back over it, possibly if this was written because of the loss of Jehoiakim, what would keep a young man going? What would keep a young psalmist going? The fact of the matter is, even though my people are going to Babylon, I remember there is a promise that God gave to our King David. That even in the midst, I don't know where the answer is going to be. I don't know how it's going to end. But all I know is that God's promises are sure. And that if we walk with Him and we love Him and we praise Him and we worship Him, that no matter how bad your struggle is, God's going to make you an overcomer. It's already in the Word of God. The end of Revelation shows us a throne of people worshiping the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. I wonder if there might be a second verse to that song. Merciful, merciful, merciful is our God. Because the only way we're going to get there is because the mercy of God was new every morning. And for the failures that we didn't even get to yet, for the, pro for the things we didn't even fall into, God's mercy. I'm not going to let you utterly fall on your face. It may hurt. It may not feel good, but you will have a chance to get back up. And if you get back up, I will give you a song of mercy. David said, Lord, if you created me a clean heart, if you renew a right spirit, if you do all these things, then will I turn sinners unto thee. I, I, didn't really have, I didn't really feel mercy until God found me at my lowest point. But God, if you get me up from this point, I promise I will with my mouth tell everybody about you. And how merciful you are today. Do we not know someone today that needs mercy? Do we not all know somebody whose life is just, why don't you call them today and just tell them, you know what? God is a merciful Savior. We're going to open up these altars today. If you want a touch from God, if you, maybe you're not where you should, maybe you just need a, a touch in your heart. Maybe you've been away from God. Maybe you just don't feel as close to God as you want to be. These altars are open. You can respond to this word today and feel the merciful touch of God in your life one more time. Would you come? It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. There's a God of mercy in this house. He's a God of unfailing mercy. Lord, here I am today, Jesus. Oh, God, I thank you for, my, for your mercy, Lord. Right in the middle of my lamenting, God. Right in the middle of my lamenting, my problems, Lord. You've got a promise that your mercy will do every morning.
You found 